As surgeons in the 21st century doing laparoscopic and other endoscopic procedures, we often take for granted the tools and techniques available to us. But the foundations of modern endoscopic imaging go back nearly a half century, and it was largely a result of the innovations of one man who persisted in developing this technology at a time when few other surgeons were interested or saw any value in the use of a laparoscope in surgical practice. You remember that in 1962, when he was still in Australia, he had written that he, it seemed uh, inconceivable to him that surgeons weren't more engaged and hadn't adopted the techniques of laparoscopy. How prophetic he was even then. He's, he's so creative, he has so much talent, but he has tenacity and he was tenacious in getting where he is today. Dr. Bursi is a phenomenal teacher, phenomenal educator, and has contributed more to laparoscopy than ever, any single individual on earth today. George is almost one of the secrets of American surgery. Uh, remember, endoscopy was not embraced to a great extent, certainly not flexible endoscopy and video endoscopy as we know it was not embraced to a great extent by the surgical community and George was one of the people from the early days who plotted and plotted and kept improving things and now is being recognized for all the contributions he made. A true inspiration. George Bursey was born in Zeged, Hungary in 1921 to a family of musicians. At age two, the family moved to Vienna, where his father had obtained a job as assistant conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic. The entire family, practically speaking, was a musician. My grandfather was a conductor of the military and a French hornist. And being in a musician family, they decided that at age three or four, I had to start to learn the violin. By the age of 10, he was playing concertos and serving as the youngest concertmaster in the history of the school orchestra. I blew uh, the Mendelssohn concerto, as far as I remember, was the first one, a little concert, and uh, uh, allegedly I was gifted. This was later debated. <laughs> In 1936, his family made the decision to return to Hungary to escape the rising anti-Semitism in Austria. The situation started in 1935, but it, there was no question that uh, the right shift became from year to year uh, more obvious and unpleasant is not the proper word to describe what does it mean. The moneymaker in the Bercy family was his uncle, or brother of his mother, whom he called his brother who was an engineer and worked for Electrolux, a Swedish firm. And at some point, his, his uncle, who was supporting the family, was told by Electrolux that because of new policies, they would have to let him go. And so the life support of the family was going to go, go away. He was having problems being told he had to sit in the back of the class. Um, and so they considered whether they would move to Sweden grandmother was really the governor of the family and she decided to come back home, as she called it, we going home. At the time, Bercy was in high school, but in Budapest, Jews were not allowed in the state schools because of the political climate. Ultimately, he gained admission to the one private Jewish school in all of Budapest, which he helped pay for by washing cars on the weekends. So I guess really the situation in Hungary wasn't that much better than it was in Austria. No, Oscar. my grandmother didn't recognize this. Still, we don't know. Uh, they didn't see the situation there, but it was irreversible. After completing high school in 1939, he wanted to attend the university medical school, but was unable to gain admission because of the restrictions on Jews. Well, it was uh, first was it's called called numerous clauses. It's too late in word means uh, two percent. Uh, and later on, it became no loose, numerous, no loose, zero percent. I couldn't get in. Instead, he obtained a position as an apprentice in an electrical shop for one year and then worked for two years in mechanical engineering. And I have to admit that at later stage, it was a help for me because I know how to mill, how to drill. I could measure uh, and I can make drawings. 
mechanical drawings. This was a great help in instrument design. During World War II, young Jewish men in Hungary were conscripted to work in labor camps across Eastern Europe. My brother was called in uh, first to the military in 1940 or 41. And then he was transferred uh, to a labor camp and uh, allegedly was killed in, in Russia and is in a mass grave near Kiev with a couple of hundred other colleagues. In 1942, uh, my age group between 22 and 24 years old uh, were uh, called in to labor camp. Once a month, they could write home or receive a postcard. Conditions were difficult, and it was bitter cold in wintertime in the mountains. They worked long days, seven days a week, and food and medical services were short. And they were in my age group people who were sick. For instance, there were a couple of epileptic boys. And when we were treated, of course, not with kids gloves, they got the attacks. And some of the wardens didn't believe that uh, they are sick and put them out in the snow. They died there. They uh, uh, put us in a forced march in the winter time. And a couple of guys, young, Chelsea, they just couldn't make it dropped out. They were shot. We had no idea whether one day they shot three or four. This was a very difficult time. Whether from malnutrition, illness, or being shot, by the end of the war, the mortality rate in the conscripted brigades like Dr. Bercy's was over 30%. Later, Bercy's unit was sent to Poland, where he worked unloading explosives for the Germans. Eventually, with the Russian advance in the east, they were moved back to Budapest, where they were to be transported to other camps in Germany or Poland. However, only this time, it was not to labor camps. They were going to put them all on trains now that they knew that they didn't need a labor crew anymore because the war was almost over. They were taking them back to the railroad station to put them on trains to Auschwitz and Birkenau. They put us in a large, last uh, carriage and somehow the brakes, they couldn't release it. And after one hour, they're playing around. We were there, 85 youngsters. They left this uh, carriage there, <laughs> took the rest of it. They detached his car, and they took the rest to Auschwitz. In June 1944, during an American air raid over Budapest, the guards for Dr. Bercy's unit disappeared, and he and his fellow prisoners escaped. The first thing is I removed, we had a yellow armband. I removed my armband, and by coincidence, I found my mother. One day, Dr. Bercy was out looking for a job, waiting for the tram, when someone recognized his Viennese accent. It turned out it was a member of the Hungarian underground who needed German speakers. I was very concerned, who the hell is he? said, don't worry, I'm in the same shoe than you are. Uh, come with me. The underground movement produced false identification papers. At that time, there were groups of 50 or 100 Jews hidden in certain houses, and the underground would deliver false papers to these places so that if the Jews left their houses, the Nazi patrols would see their IDs and let them pass. It was dangerous work. That time, life didn't mean very much because we saw how many of our friends were killed. Therefore, you became very fatalistic. You really couldn't care less about the situation. You were you're interested to help and to get out somehow. In one assignment, Bercy was asked to go to the Hotel Astoria in the middle of Budapest, where the German headquarters were. He posed as an electrician in order to make copies of the official stamp, which the Germans changed periodically, because without it, the papers the underground fabricated would have been useless. You go there and you tell them that you get a phone call. There is a, a short circuit there in the half house or Astoria is without electricity. There is a German soldier sitting in the front. Therefore, I went there, 
and showed my paperwork I was called and gave them the story. He went in, I took out and watched <laughs> uh, very careful uh, and put the stamp there, put the stamp back, put the stamp on this white paper, put it in my pocket. I was a little bit uh, concerned somebody comes, what the hell are you doing with the German stamp? In late December 1944, the approaching Russian army encircled Budapest. The remaining 60,000 German and Hungarian soldiers continued to fight and conditions in the city were extreme. Although unable to transport the Jews to the death camps now, the Germans adopted a new strategy, what they called an evening walk to the Danube. Yeah, they took around a couple of thousand people per day to uh, Jews from the ghetto to the Danube. It was winter, December, November, December and machine gun them down. In January 1945, Budapest was liberated by the Russians. First of all, you don't believe that you are free. But now that uh, you just wouldn't believe it, that I can walk around and it doesn't make a difference what my religion is. And uh, of course, we were also interested in what will happen. Although they were now freed from the Nazis, the Bursis, along with everyone else in Budapest, were starving. So they decided to leave Budapest and return to Zegged. There was no food in all of Europe, basically, and the cities were worse. So when they decided to go back to Zegged, Zegged has farmland around it, and they thought there might be food there. But Zegged was three hours away, and the official railway was not running. So Bercy used his access to sulfa, the only antibiotic of the day, to trade with the Russian soldiers for a ride for him and his family on a Russian military train. Because they liked also the girls. There were pretty high incidents of gonorrhea. And I paid myself off to the train give them sulfa. After the war, Bercy wanted to return to Budapest and study music at the academy. I enjoyed music. I was deeply involved. I understood music. And this, if you're brought up in a family where everybody loves music or make music, uh, and uh, somehow this was in my trans umbilical transfusion, all right? And I, I really wanted to become a conductor. But cut the story short, I have a, a Jewish mother who made the decision, you will be a doctor. In 1945, Bercy was accepted into medical school at the university in Zegged. To help pay for expenses, he worked evenings as a technician in the Department of Physiology and Biochemistry. During the time he was in medical school, but he was also supporting himself and his mother and his stepfather who were unable to find work. So he was doing all of that while he was in medical school. In the fourth year, he won a prize from the Department of Surgery, which gave him free room and board. And he worked almost every night giving anesthesia for emergency cases and helping the nurses clean instruments. In 1950, he graduated from medical school and started his surgical training in Zegged. It was during surgical residency that Bercy became interested in experimental work. His first study was looking at methods for preservation of arteries. This was the pre-Decron area, and they talked in the prof that on the top of the surgical clinic we should have an animal lab. And we started to transplant uh, on dogs' uh, femoral arteries. They did similar work in cadaveric grafts and a year later repaired a vascular injury following a gunshot wound to the arm using a cadaver graft of the same blood type they had preserved, work which they subsequently published in 1951. In 1952, he lost his position at the university in Zegged because of trouble with the communist authorities. It was a political episode. I, I didn't behave properly, allegedly. Then one day he received a phone call from a Dr. Boris Petrovsky, the Russian consultant to the Hungarian Minister of Health, who had heard about his work on the arterial grafts, which was of interest to the Soviet military. He said, I'm sorry, I would, I would like to continue, but I don't have a job, I can't take a job, because politically I'm very unstable, according to certain uh, information. This was the end of my interview. What Bercy did not know was that Petrovsky, who later became the Minister of Health for the Soviet Union under Leonid Brezhnev, 
then called for the paperwork on Bercy and found that the allegations were untrue. A few days later, he was given a job in the postgraduate surgery school in Budapest. He quickly established an experimental surgery section and began studies of portal hypertension. I became interested because the Hungarian drank very well, and there was enough cirrhotic patients and bleeding. He put a fluoroscope in one of the ORs and did hepatic vein catheterizations to determine whether patients had portal hypertension. Although Bercy's academic work had begun to thrive, there were many challenges under the communist system, and all decisions at the university were under the authority of the local party secretary. With the liberation of Hungary in 1945, there was obvious exhilaration and freedom. But how long did it take before you realized that the communists were also implementing a, a totalitarian system? Well, uh, we had originally for one year, I guess, a multi-party system. But when I thought uh, first that uh, with one uh, uh, trick, you know, they cleaned the parliament, and suddenly we became a uniparty system. But uh, it was no difference between one system or the other. Dictatorship is dictatorship. The color doesn't make a difference, whether it's green or red. If the individual freedom is interfered, if we can't open our mouths without telling our opinion, without the fear, the next day we will lose the job or we end up uh, with uh, uh, somewhere to be interrogated, then uh, this is not the way of life. In October 1956, Dr. Bercy was working in the University Hospital in Budapest as a general surgeon when the Hungarian Revolution overthrew the communist government in Hungary. What was your recollection of those events? That finally we get freedom. Finally we get a democracy. And we don't have to have a fear. And so uh, we won this game in the first week. Everything went very smoothly. During the chaos of the first week of the revolution, Bercy and his colleagues were able to break into the party secretary's office at the hospital and obtain their personal files. One episode describes some comments he made during a university choir trip to Zurich almost 10 years earlier. They sent us out, two guys, me and somebody else. And the guy who was sent with me was a spy because he wrote it down that I found Hungarians in Zurich in the in a coffee shop and I spoke to them and they were of course uh, escaped earlier and their communist names and what I said, etc. That they kept their eye on me. There were also comments he had made in the operating room that were reported by nurses and one of his anesthesia colleagues. But in those days, a political comment could have been we don't have enough sponges. I wish they'd get new equipment. They, you know, this scalpel hasn't been sharpened. Or whatever you complained about was considered anti-government. So anything you complained about, someone could and did report you for it. Yeah, therefore, uh, it was a clear cut that they had a very good organized spy system. The Hungarians' freedom was short-lived, however, as several days later the Soviet Politburo reversed course and sent troops into Hungary to crush the revolution. In the central square in Budapest, they suddenly opened fire on thousands of demonstrators. The hospital where Dr. Bercy was stationed was nearby and received numerous casualties. We received, in, within an hour, we were very near to the parliament, relatively near approximately 250 severely injured people. We were not trained in triaging, but one of our senior colleagues uh, went with a marking pen around and put from one till four a number of the, the guys who were bleeding and on the floor. It was a, a, a terrible memory picture. Bercy and staff operated continuously for two days and nights. And they ran out of everything. They ran out of blood, they ran out of sterile pads, they ran out of gloves, they ran out of everything after a while. Of course, uh, it was clear 
on this particular day that I will leave Hungary. Soon thereafter, he found a conductor who worked on the one railway line that went to the border with Austria, whom he was able to bribe for passage for him and his family. They had to get off the train one stop before the border, however, otherwise they would have been stopped and turned back. It was nighttime, there was a cornfield, and uh, uh, Russians in, uh, were nearby uh, the borderline, and sometimes uh, they have the uh, lights. Uh, Searchlights. Searchlights, right. And it was uh, snow and rain. It was around three miles, uh, the border which we had to pass. And uh, my mother uh, didn't take it very well. And after a mile or so, I don't know, she suddenly gave up. She can't do it. She wants, she wants to go back. Uh, therefore, I took my mother and we dropped everything. She yelled around a little bit and I carried her over and over the borderline and ended up in an Austrian village, borderline village. And the suitcase that his mother would not drop, she said, I'll die here in the field. But the suitcase had her photos, and those photos are, are here in our living room. All the photos of her family, that's what she carried with her. This is the album, as you can see. And, and all the pictures of their family, George, they're exactly as they were. And this is what she was willing to die for, not to have to leave this one thing behind. That was all she was taking out of the country. Although the Austrians were no longer allowing refugees into Vienna, as there were already 60,000 Hungarians there, Dr. Bercy, because he spoke fluent Viennese, made a deal to secure their passage there. He was able to get his family members a bed, but not one for himself. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, he walked into a police station. I introduced myself in Viennese. I said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, I'm a Hungarian. We had a little chat, and then I told them, a summary said, listen, we make a deal with you. We know that a, a couple of Hungarians who are refugees or said they're refugees, they're communist spies. And if you help us with an interpreter here, we, we're looking after you. You could imagine uh, food, etc. Therefore, I got a nice cell. And you help, then you help translate for the yeah. communist spies. Yeah, whoever comes, you know, they uh, had hundreds of people there. They became good chums with a couple of police officers there. And they put me in a nice place afterwards because they had for selected people, you know. They uh, had uh, some homes. He's yep. so resourceful at every turn. Who would have thought to have just walked into the police station and I start a up a conversation? Well, I, I mentioned him, I mentioned that I have American Express. <laughs> Following the escape from Hungary, Dr. Bercy obtained temporary work at a university clinic in Vienna. He then interviewed for and was awarded a two-year Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. With that support, he decided in 1957 to leave Europe and immigrate to Australia. Why Australia? George listened a lot to Radio for Europe, and in the United States in the 50s, they were talking about the possibility of a communist infiltration, that they were coming to our shores at any moment. And George just decided, I'm not going any place where somebody's going to be landing on the shores, where there's going to be another war. And he just thought, Australia, nobody's going there. He and his family left from Genoa, Italy, on a boat along with 800 other Hungarian immigrants. Five weeks later, they landed in Western Australia and were transported to a camp with other immigrants. In 1957, you arrived in Australia with a Rockefeller Fellowship, not speaking a word of English, and having no idea where you were going to work. That's correct. I have not the slightest idea. Therefore, after a week or so, I decided uh, take a couple of steps uh, to do something, and therefore 
I decided to go to Melbourne or to Sydney and toss the Australian coin, and uh, it was Melbourne. He then hitched a ride to Melbourne 300 miles away, where quite by accident, he landed in a section of the city where there were other Hungarian immigrants. As he walked along, he overheard someone speaking Hungarian in a telephone booth. And I introduced himself. Uh, it was very nice to me. He took me to the university next day. Um, I had with me the Rockefeller Foundation letter that I got a fellowship, but I didn't speak English. I was introduced to uh, uh, Professor Morris Ewing. Of course, I had a couple of papers with me about my previous experimental work. We spoke to an interpreter, and it was clear that I need urgent help. Uh, in sense, uh, I have no money, I have no, uh, don't know where to live, and he helped me. Uh, first of all, he gave me a tech job in the lab. And uh, the major issue is was communication. Therefore, the Australian government for immigrants has uh, evening schools. And I uh, was able to attend this every night. I learned around 100, 100 20 words a day. Within six months, he'd learned enough English to communicate and began running an experimental surgery program. His early work focused on the problem of portal hypertension and esophageal varices in an induced canine model of cirrhosis. As a part of the study, he began performing laparoscopy in the animals to assess their livers. And what gave you the idea to laparoscope the dogs? I know about laparoscopy already. Uh, the biopsy is much more accurate, and you get a very good uh, uh, visual image how the liver looks. For this work, he won the Glisson Prize of the Royal Austral-Asian College of Surgeons and was awarded with a lectureship position at the University of Melbourne, the first ever given in surgery in Australia to a foreigner. He also was able to obtain a medical license and operating privileges at the University Hospital. Soon, his interest shifted from portal hypertension to the biliary system and the problem of common bile duct stones. Well, first of all, it was amazing how many uh, negative common bile duct expirations we have. I, I think the average figures was 50% was negative expiration. The retained stone uh, incidence was also high. And this brought me to the idea, seeing the cystoscope, that why don't we use something to look into the tunnel to see what we're doing or what we should do. Percy began using a cystoscope to examine the interior of the bile duct, but the image was dark and visualization was poor. This is where my coin dropped, that we have to find a better system. At that time, cholangiography was also very primitive and involved use of still images only. So he brought a fluoroscope into the operating room and began using it to perform cholangiograms. It was the first such unit in Australia and one of the first in the world. We had a new operating room and we put a, a fluoro, fluoroscope there for fluoroscopic uh, uh, cholangiography. I discovered one aspect immediately, that we, which is very important, is the radiation to patient and to surgeon. Therefore, I was very fortunate that I met an engineer, and he developed a system where you pulsing the fluoro, therefore reducing significantly uh, the uh, uh, radiation dosage. This technology was later picked up by the x-ray industry and developed into the mobile C-arm, which was first adopted by orthopedic surgeons because of the enormous radiation exposures they had at the time. Bercy also began performing laparoscopy clinically, initially to do biopsies for staging oncology patients. And uh, there's no question that the end results, if you do it uh, not blindly with a needle was better because we had one advantage. If you got bleeding in the liver, from the liver, we were able to uh, coagulate under visual control. I tried to put this message over, but it wasn't accepted. In 1959, Bercy visited the Royal Technical Institute in London, where he met with the chairman there, who was one of the inventors of image amplification. I asked him, 
whether is there anybody in the, in the Royal Tech who is an optical engineer, a lecturer who is interested in medical optics? And the answer was, yeah, there's a very interesting uh, 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 guy. I think he was a bit crazy. Uh, he's a lecturer. His name is Harold Hopkins, and he has some ideas. Perhaps I bring you together with him. Bercy arranged to meet Hopkins, who was somewhat suspicious of foreigners with a strong accent, over dinner. But Hopkins was late, and while waiting for him, Bercy began whistling a violin concerto. And he came in and said, how in the hell do you know this concerto? And I gave him a little background, and he put me on a higher level, because I know a little bit of music. To cut the story short, he took me to the lab, and he showed me his prototype. And then I saw from the performance that this is a revolution in optics. Sometime after that, Bercy made contact with the head of a small company whom he had met a year earlier who was interested in surgical instrumentation and visualization. The head of that company was a man by the name of Carl Stortz. I was very impressed by him as a, as a human being, um, I was very impressed uh, by him, by his precision. He was already involved in ENT and a couple of other areas. Everybody knew that it's a prototype, what Hopkins has. Nobody has a machinery. Hopkins did it practically uh, with a little shop by hand. But if you go in mass production, you have to, de uh, you have to develop a new polishing glass cutting, etc., to get these rod lenses. And Stortz was interested in this. Bercy persuaded Stortz and his daughter Sybil to go to London to meet Hopkins. Stortz was likewise impressed and was able to purchase the license to the rod lens technology. But it took time to develop the machinery to produce the glass rods. Professor Bercy and my father have had one specific characteristic in common. They were not satisfied and almost restless until ideal solution was found. That means that many discussions, many uh, prototypes has been made and produced and tested uh, between the different meetings. Within two years, Stortz began manufacturing Hopkins rod lens scopes for surgical use, initially cystoscopes where the demand was greatest, and later laparoscopes. I, I think George Bercy's greatest contribution is the early work he did with Carl Stortz on the rod lens telescope. Because that's the tool that really made laparoscopy possible. Meanwhile, Bercy became interested in recording images seen through the endoscope, and in 1960 developed the first TV camera for recording endoscopic procedures. I saw these uh, television cameras in Australia. They were 150 pounds in weight, called Orticon. These were the first three-tube cameras. With the help of an electrical engineer, Bercy was able to get a one-half-inch camera video tube produced, which weighed only a couple of ounces. He began recording images with this new system, and in 1961, at a time when many families did not even have television, published a paper entitled Medicine and Television. He later televised a live bronchoscopy procedure from his hospital to an audience at a surgical meeting in Melbourne, but it wasn't accepted because the images were in black and white and had low resolution. We didn't have optics, proper optics. We didn't have light. These are very, two very important components to have a good video image. This is where my coin dropped, that we have to find a better system. In 1962, Bercy began a year of fellowship with Henry Harkins at the University of Washington in Seattle. He did animal experiments where he put ball bearings into the gallbladder and then made cholecystography x-rays to show the various stages of the ball bearings passing and the relative size which caused biliary dilatation. It was also there that he got the first cholidocoscope from Carl Stortz and, with Harkins, began using it in the operating room. And when uh, the surgeons, including him, used this for exploration, there was no question that he could magnificently and accurately uh, examine the distal and the proximal part. While Bercy was still in Seattle, a surgeon in Los Angeles at the Cedars Hospital, Manny Shore, heard about his colidocoscope work and invited Bercy to give a lecture there. 
It was there that he met the chairman of the Department of Surgery, Leon Morgenstern, who would become a lifelong colleague and friend. And I heard Dr. Bercy give a presentation, which I was very impressed with. And so I invited Dr. Bercy in 1967 to uh, join the Department of Surgery as a visiting scholar or a visiting scientist for a year. As a result of his work on various prototypes across multiple disciplines, Morgan Stern invited Bercy in 1969 to join the full-time faculty at Cedars as director of a multidisciplinary surgical endoscopy unit, a completely new concept at that time. The concept was brand new. Everybody was laughing. But Leon Morgenstern, the chairman, had some vision. Endoscopy needs specialized assistance. Otherwise, your, your instruments are not kept well. The procedure is faster, the patient is better off, the accessories are there, and it costs less money. And I knew Dr. Bercy would bring a lot of talent in the development, and uh, he quickly became involved in uh, the surgical procedures in nearly all of the surgical departments, even when they didn't ask him. Well, one feature that I'll uh, mention about Dr. Bercy, which worried me a little bit in the beginning, he made a lot of requests. And uh, I wasn't sure I could afford what he asked for. But to my good fortune, and for his good fortune, and the good fortune of surgical endoscopy, I gave him what he wanted. Bercy's work during the 1970s at Cedars impacted virtually every surgical specialty. His improvements to the cystoscope transformed the field, improving diagnostic cystoscopy and leading to a shift from open prostatectomy to transurethral resection for benign prostatic hypertrophy. With Paul Ward, he developed a 5 millimeter indirect laryngoscope that replaced mirror laryngoscopy, and he also developed a direct operative laryngoscope with Ed Cantor. He developed the field of pediatric endoscopy, made possible by his work on miniaturization of the equipment, which allowed endoscopic removal of swallowed foreign bodies, and with Stephen Gans, performed the first endoscopic visualization of a tracheoesophageal fistula in an infant. He introduced colonoscopy at Cedars, and in 1973 published the first series of 100 successful colonoscopic polypectomies. Dr. Bercy also performed laparoscopic procedures, primarily with a gynecologist for tubal sterilization. It was very difficult to put the message over in 1970, except the gynecologist. Therefore, I trained here the West Coast, every gynecologist who was interested. But in, again, they were more interested than the surgeon. We did in the first year 600 tubal sterilization. During this time, Bercy perfected the art of photographic documentation of endoscopic pathology, and he developed a number of instruments for laparoscopic surgery, including a suction coagulation cannula and the laparoscopic hook scissors. He also worked on bipolar electrosurgery more than two decades before its use became widespread. This is a uh, drawing that uh, George and I uh, sent back and forth to each other back in the 70s of a bipolar snare. And based on these drawings, we would build models and try them out. And this is what uh, George was so, so good at. Uh, is trying them out, giving us quick feedback, and letting us learn uh, the issues we had to address to overcome the problems and make a much better product. He promoted the use of fluoroclangiography in the U.S., and he continued to develop operative cholidocoscopy. And George developed a right angle scope with Stortz and then introduced it, and it became the standard before flexible uh, cholidocoscopes, and, and George was the father of that. And people forget that he was the master of the common bile duct. I first met George when I was a second or third year resident at LA County USC Medical Center, and he came to show us the rigid cholidocoscope. And we had just a tremendous amount of uh, biliary disease and a lot of common duct stones, and it was transformative because before using the cholidocoscope, we were just putting in Bacchus dilators and suction catheters, and 
we were doing it blindly and having a high rate of retained common duct stones and we didn't have endoscopic sphincterotomy, it meant reoperation. It was my go-to instrument that uh, I used uh, every single uh, week. In 1976, Bercy published a seminal work, a book devoted entirely to endoscopy and that covered both the basic principles of imaging and optics and the spectrum of clinical applications in gastrointestinal, gynecologic, and thoracic endoscopy. This is a copy of your book, Endoscopy, which was published in 1976. And I was especially impressed with the quality of the photographic images that you have in this book. Some of these look like they could have been taken yesterday. One of Bercy's greatest contributions to surgery during the 1970s, however, was his work on illumination for endoscopic visualization. The globe arc light in use at that time generated tremendous heat and was prone to explosions. We found this ceramic globe, which was developed by the American Army, that uh, we got this one and we built the first unit and it was marvelous. And today, 32 years later, every endoscopic manufacturer, to my knowledge, using the same globe. The other problem that remained to be solved was the inability to project images in the OR onto a TV monitor in color. But in 1984, he became aware of a miniature television camera that had been developed by Sircon that Bercy helped rebuild so it could be sterilized. We attached a small television camera and everybody saw it. Comfortable, the image is large we could coordinate movements. Along with his prior work on the laparoscope, the safer and improved light source and acceptable color video system were the two final pieces needed to extend endoscopic surgery to other areas. In the 1980s, Bercy assisted in the founding of the SAGES organization and was instrumental in its early growth and development. I'll tell you what George meant to the formation and development of SAGES. Uh, first of all, as a surgeon performing endoscopy, he brought credibility and he promulgated the importance of surgeons getting uh, involved. In the late 1980s, surgeons developed methods for removing the gallbladder laparoscopically, the first step in the laparoscopic revolution. The laparoscopic revolution and the development of laparoscopic biliary surgery, did you see it coming? The laparoscopic revolution uh, was obvious. As soon as uh, laparoscopy was developed, uh, we did with Alfred Cushier, he was a leader in Britain. We uh, considered in experimental animals to making a cholecystostomy laparoscopically, remove the stone and remove the mucosa. Uh, in other words, we, we already played around with various ideas. Later, uh, Bercy and Ed Phillips at Cedar sinai were working on performing cholecystectomy laparoscopically, experimentally in the lab, when they heard about a surgeon in Nashville, Eddie Joe Reddick, who was already doing lap coles in humans. We got on a jet together and went out to see it, and uh, of course he was doing it with laser, but about 80% of the procedure was the same as our technique. We had developed ours with electrocautery, and then we performed the first in a trial of 20 patients, and uh, the rest is history. In 1989, uh, George Bercy decided that he wanted to train all the academic uh, surgeons um, who were interested in laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, how to do uh, laparoscopy. George uh, then proceeded to send me a list of about 150 surgeons who wanted to learn laparoscopy. So slowly, month by month, we ticked through this list of 150 and, and picked up quite a few additional uh, people along the way. One of the other problems in the early days of laparoscopic cholecystectomy was the variability in the training courses that were being offered to surgeons. And Bercy was concerned that the training in some cases was poor and potentially dangerous to patients. Through SAGES, he and others developed a series of train the trainers courses that educated a generation of surgeons in how to perform and teach laparoscopy. And later, with Ken Ford, he helped formulate the SAGES framework for postgraduate residency training guideline, 
which gave definition to that process. The guidelines were crucial because other surgical societies had no ideas or time or didn't do it. We were very con concerned about the uh, injuries, which were in the first two years higher than it should be. But uh, the sages again helped significantly with an organized system to teach and to put the message over. We met through sages. I, I knew who George was for three years before I ever had a social word with him. He was, I knew he was a guru. He was head of the resident ed committee. Our early conversations consisted primarily of Dr. Bercy, what time would you like your resident ed committee meeting? And him telling me and my trying to get some different time. But, um, and then in 1987, we were at Lee Smith's suite. I heard George telling a joke, which I, I won't tell you now. And I was shocked to hear that he would tell a joke. And Lee Smith said, George Bercy's hysterical. He's really funny. And I said, the little Hungarian guy? By late 1988, George and Barbara began seeing each other socially and were planning to get married, although hardly anyone in the Sages organization were aware that they were even an item. At the conclusion of the October 1989 Sages board meeting, Barbara informed the board that she was moving to L.A. and was getting married. And Rick Green dutifully said, who are you marrying? And I said, George Bercy. So that may be the only time the entire board of Sages was shocked and quiet. Together, the Bercy's impact on Sages has been immeasurable. George, what has Barbara and her management corporation meant to the growth and development of Sages? The first thing which was very impressive, that uh, she really not only organized, but uh, she organized the members because we know it. But she made it very well that uh, she did it in a way that the guy really didn't feel that he's directed. No question, she contributed enormously. Uh, to, uh, to Sages. It was very interesting to be sitting in my chair during the laparoscopic revolution and to also be George's wife. But I think there was a synergism of our talking about what had to be done and brainstorming about it and kind of just getting it done. I'm biased, but I don't think there would be a Sages without them. I really think they both were so instrumental, especially in those early years and through the laparoscopic revolution and through the 90s. There was a time in 1999 when Barbara and I faced a very challenging situation, a, a very frightening and scary situation. But I was talking to her about it at their home and Dr. B came up to me and said, we do not live in fear. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said it again. We do not live in fear. And to hear those words coming from a man who had survived the Holocaust and communism and many other trials in life really was a great impact. In 1992, Bercy was nominated to serve as president of Sages. Among the many accomplishments in his presidential year were development of a SAGES preceptorship registry, initiation of a resident and fellow membership recruitment program, and development of a joint task force with ASGE to work on privileging guidelines in flexible endoscopy. In his SAGES presidential address, he spoke about many issues in GI surgery that are as pertinent today as they were in 1993. The importance of training and education, patient safety, controlling costs of health care, and being careful not to utilize technology for its own sake, but only for the benefit of the patient. We should always push the envelope, he said, but sometimes we shouldn't mail the letter. One of the things that I think is, is unique about George as one of these scientific visionaries is that, as you said, he doesn't think that just because you can do it means you should do it. So I think that more people would listen to George when he said, hey, let's put the brakes on for a minute and think about this. Bercy considers one of his most important contributions to Sages to be the transition in leadership. 
Perhaps the most important what I saw is that it would be very important uh, to educate the younger generation for leadership positions because this will make uh, the continuity in the survival of, in the directions of uh, uh, SAGES. In 2001, SAGES established the George Bercy Lifetime Achievement Award, which is to be bestowed for a lifetime contribution as an innovator in the field of endoscopic surgery. George Bercy Lifetime Achievement Award should indicate for everyone, for every SAGES member, past, present, future, that George is part of the fabric of SAGES. On Bercy's 85th birthday, SAGES held a festschrift in his honor at the annual meeting. And Barbara, you wrote that he changed the face of surgery, but still considers himself a violinist who happened to do something else with his life. I think that's true. And I think it says a lot about him. He, he conducts whenever we go to a musical event. He sits in his chair and he's still conducting. You know, he became a world-renowned surgeon, but I still think that he that he thinks that this was a secondary thing. And I, that's amazing that he could put that much energy into his second favorite thing. I still thinking that I would have been a superb conductor. Your daughter quoted, you've always been on edge, whether it's a new way of teaching, a new medical instrument, or, or a never before attempted surgical technique. He still sleeps with a yellow pad next to his bed so that if he gets up with an idea in the middle of the night or early in the morning, he can draw it. I think he is still as much on the edge as he was the day I met him, which is absolutely phenomenal. In 2011, Dr. Bercy was honored by the American College of Surgeons as the 17th recipient of the Jacobson Award in recognition of his pioneering contributions over 50 years to the art and science of endoscopy and laparoscopy. And I was there uh, in Washington um, to see him receive that. So uh, they were reading off this litany of things that George had done. I mean, I knew George, and I know all the things he's done, but it, it was mind-boggling even to me to hear all the things that George has done. I, I think what made it even uh, more satisfying is that George was the first SAGES member to win the Jacobson Innovation Award. Well, I was surprised and extremely impressed. Being a company of Staatsel, um, who did enormous work, Fogarty, you know, uh, a little mercy <laughs> there. And I really, I was humbled uh, to be the number 17. And Bercy has recently received long overdue recognition in his native Hungary where he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Semmelweis University in Budapest, where they also named a building after him, the George Bercy Surgical Training and Research Laboratory. At the age of 90, George Bercy continues to innovate and develop new ways to improve surgical technology. And, uh, being still involved in certain new and exciting projects, it's uh, a very nice, in interesting momentum every day to see something which is new because the end result is clearly an improvement to patient's care. Among his contributions since he retired from surgical practice has been the development of video endoscopic means for intubation under direct visual control an approach that can be especially useful for patients with difficult airways and for teaching. I think it's instructive for people who wonder if you can be productive to look at George's CV and see what he's done since he was 80. So George is in this unique category of people who have spent a lifetime even into their 90s. And there are very few people that can look back and say, I innovated my whole life. Even though I was 90 years old, I was still trying to make the world a better place. Uh, you'd think that George, uh, at 90, would have uh, stopped thinking. Every day he has a new idea, and he'll call me up and he said, you know, if we took a scope and mounted it above the spine, then the spinal surgeon and everyone else in the room could see into the uh, field better, and it would be magnified. 
It's so logical. But no one thought of it but George. And he then doesn't stop with the idea. He implements it. He drives you crazy until you try it. And then you go, why didn't I think of that? He, he's a visionary.